Okay, now I'm not going to bore you too much, but I have a PowerPoint slide, so I'm going to bore you all to death when we get to like 312, if somebody's passed out, you know. Um, the thing that we're, um, I think there's a misnomer about comics to film, because what has everybody been talking about? Superheroes. Sure. Superheroes have been around for years. I mean, Superman was the first superhero in comics. I mean, there were heroes, but he was actually the first superhero. Now, um, one one question I have: Who has seen Wonder Woman here? Okay, who currently reads Wonder Woman? I don't know who she is. Exactly. Uh, part part of part of the problem with the comics to you know film and television, for that matter, there's a huge disconnect. I mean, okay, everybody's watched The Walking Dead. Who reads The Walking Dead? Yeah, I stopped after a few like. Right, but, <laughs> but at the percentage here, you are the one percent, if that. Now, obviously, you know, superheroes are big business. You know, you know, because they're also, you know, there, there's good, there's bad. You know, um, you know, we go back to you know Dark Knight. We have Suicide Squad. We have everything. Back to they're all superheroes. Now there are, there have been a few League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, yes. which was based on an Alan Moore uh, graphic novel. Um, but really, the current crop of comics definitely goes back to Superman, and it's not Superman the movie; it was just called Superman. Um, the biggest key is that. There is one word that Richard Donner had in making that film, verisimilitude. And that is what verisimilitude is, the appearance of truth or resemblance to reality. And why does Superman, the 1978 film, work so well? Because of verisimilitude. There was two things that made that film beyond you know, his, his verisimilitude. It was Richard Donner and Christopher Reeve. And one of the things that most people do not know is that DC Comics was financially struggling in that period. As a matter of fact, they nearly stopped publishing comics at that point. In 1978, they were going to have a thing called the DC Explosion where they were going to expand the line, make more comics. Well, it actually turned into the DC Implosion because they ended up canceling it. And Warner Brothers at the time did own, and they still do own DC, DC Comics. And they were actually contemplating just putting out reprints because they said people buy those. But it was because of Superman. It changed everything. You know, and it, it has probably one of the greatest taglines you will ever hear in a movie. You will believe a man can fly. Because up to that point, we had never seen anything like that. We we had had there there had been serials, there had been radio shows, but you know we had the the '66 Batman, which was very successful of its time. Obviously, I mean, it was one of those things everybody wanted to be on that. But there are many more comics that have been made in the films that you do not realize, like Ghost World, based on the Daniel Klaus graphic novel, the same name. He actually wrote the screenplay for this. It was directed by Kerry Zwigoff, who had directed the documentary Crumb about Robert Crumb. And if you've not seen that documentary, it is a must see. Um, there, I mean, there, and also people also tend to think of just American comics and American superheroes. Heavy metal is actually metal hurlant. It was published over here. And the interesting thing about heavy metal, I hope we've all probably seen heavy metal. Did you know that most of the stories were actually based on stories published in heavy metal? Bernie Wrightson did Captain Stern. There was So Beautiful, So Dangerous, which is completely different in the film. It has nothing to do with the story. But the only, the only sequence that was actually original for, made for the movie was the Tarnas sequence. That was the only one made for that. The rest of them were adaptions of the of stories that existed. 30 Days of Night, Steve Niles and Ben Templesmith. Now here's, here's a story. That was one of IDW's first 
books that they nearly picked up. Wasn't a huge seller, but eventually it did get picked up by Columbia Pictures and made into 30 Days of Night in the film. Now here's also an interesting thing. Steve Niles, whenever he does a book, he's created a lot of books, he actually gives half of the co-creatorship to the artists. Because once again, as with, you know, comics are very important with the writer and the artist. Because you can't, you have great script, and if you have crappy art, it can nearly kill the book. And vice versa, you can have great art, but if you have a crappy story, it doesn't make any, you know, doesn't make any sense. Now, we have an interesting one here with Fritz the Cat. Fritz the Cat was an underground book by Robert Crumb, and it was also Ralph Baschke's first film. So what do we see in the title? The Life and Death of Fritz the Cat. The death of Fritz the Cat came after Robert Crumb saw the film. He could not stand that film. He hated that film with a passion. So that he actually hated that film so much, he killed Fritz the Cat just so he would never have to draw it again. Because the film was so successful, that's all anybody said. When, you know, they didn't look at his other one. You know. So he said, that's it, I'm killing him, he's gone. Now we have Valerian, which just came out based on a French graphic novel. There's a lot of, in France, comics are considered art. They're, they are considered just as important as, you know, classic art pieces. They have, they have if you think San Diego's Comic Con big, they have a convention over there for a week that they shut the city down just for that convention. Every creator in Europe goes to this convention. It is that big. Now, as we have seen, sometimes comic adaptions are hit and miss, you know. Obviously, Valerian is in the latter category of the miss part. It'll be appreciated years from now. Probably. Now, here's the interesting thing. But it'll be appreciated. Um, there's a lot of uh, most people think that Speed Racer was actually based on the animated series, which is not, because the animated series was actually based on the original manga, Mach Go Go Go. And so, obviously, the Wacharski, now sisters, were heavily influenced by the, the not only the animated series, but, you know, with manga in general. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of... And, did, did you all know that Edge of Tomorrow is actually an adaption of a book? Most people don't. Now, it's loosely adapted, and they take the same thing, but there's a lot of influence in film from comics that most people don't realize. Now, Akira is obviously probably the most well-known film, you know, an anime film in the United States. It was actually pretty successful when it was initially released in English. The interesting thing about the film was that that ending is not the ending of the original story. The reason for that was that Otomo was not finished with the novel. He would not tell them the ending of the novel. So they basically, so the ending of the movie, they basically just made it up because they had to end it. But once again, that's where you see the creative side, you know, where obviously the film has to, you know, kind of, you know, amalgamate what the original source material. Now here's an interesting one. Persopolis is Rompi's experiences of growing up in Iran and being a female growing up. Now the, the, the graphic novel was originally translated into French first, then it, it did become worldwide and she also ended up writing the script for the film. So that one is actually literally a literal adaption of the book. Snowpiercer, another one. Most people don't realize that it's based on a French graphic novel. And once again, we go back to the France thing, where France understands how you know important you know art is in general, whether it's comics or anything else. And of course, what we've seen throughout, how many spandex have we seen so far? Not too many. You know, be, the reason being is because there's actually a lot. Now, Aesthetic is one of the biggest selling comics in France. There is an Aesthetic film that was only released in France because ultimately they felt 
since the, since the characters were not well known enough outside France that it would not sell. But um, it is it is kind of an interesting film. It's very French. It's very interesting. Uh, but the comics are actually very great. Now we have Stardust. Stardust based on a original. It was Neil Gaiman had intended to kind of be a novel, but. He also felt that that just wasn't enough. So what he did is he called up Charles Vess and said, you know, I have this novel, but it needs to be illustrated, but not necessarily straight as a comic. The interesting thing about Stardust the film was, is it actually was independently produced and financed. It was Matthew Vaughn's first film. Now what did Matthew Vaughn go on to do? He went on to do Kick-Ass. He went on to do X-Men First Class. He's doing the Kingsman films. Which is, you know, very interesting because, a lot, you know, a lot of those are actually based on other pro comic properties. I think it's also interesting that Superman vs. Daredevil. We also have a history of violence. <laughs> Date, now, this one's very interesting because the entire last act of the movie is completely different from the graphic novel. But yet, it's understandable. First of all, it's, it's very Cronenberg. You know, he, he chose, you know, the source material is perfect for him, but the ending works very well for the graphic novel, but not necessarily for film. So sometimes, as a filmmaker, you need to look at things. And the point is, what Cronenberg did do with the history of violence is he made sure he kept the essence of what that graphic novel is. What was the point of the story? Because you can't always be 100% faithful even though in a comic you have ultimately an unlimited budget. But in a film you have a budget and you have to make things off, you know, work. It depends on your actors and things like that. That's where, as a filmmaker, you, you, you need to know your source material as you're doing it. You just don't pick the script and go, hey, let's go. And I think the history of violence is a good example of something where, you know. Then we have J.O. Bars Crow based on the film. Unfortunately, obviously, the tragedy of that was the passing of Brandon Levy before the film was entirely finished. It was mostly um, And yeah, actually, it's a very faithful adaption. And they keep trying to, they're trying to restart the franchise again, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere at the moment. Road to Perdition is another one. Most people don't know it's based on a graphic novel. It's actually based on, there are two Graphic novels, it, 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 the first and the second release. So. Um, and once again, you know, no spandex. So you see, there's a lot of stuff that's not. We have the infamous Alan Moore, who <laughs> will never take credit for any of his books to film. But in the case of From Hell, the actual book is, if you watch the film, you think it's just about Jack the Ripper. The actual comic is not. It's about the entire period of Jack the Ripper. It's not, Jack the Ripper is the main story, is the thread that holds the story together. But it deals with the period of Victorian London and, you know, how, you know, basically he created the story of the, you know, what is true life, but he fictionalized how all those events revolved around Jack the Ripper. Now, in the case of the film, it's, it's as in Watchmen, it's unfilmable in that respect. It's too big. So what the what they did, the filmmakers, they basically just took the essence of what the Jack the Ripper was and went with that, which works to an extent and sometimes doesn't. Again, Mystery Men, another oddball. Uh, the characters were created by Bob Burden uh, in Flaming Carrot Comics. Uh, and it's really more so not much of an adaption because I, I think really those comics are pretty much unfilmable. Uh, but an interesting, interesting film, uh, to say the least. Uh, we go farther. Then we have The Rocketeer, probably one of the greatest, you know, comic book adaptions. Um, and the thing is that it's it's exceptionally faithful. The, the, obviously, the one change is what was the name of the character in the comic? Betty. Huh? Girl? Yes, Betty. Betty. Betty Page. Betty Page was a real person. She was a pinup model in the 50s. Uh, Disney got a little nervous at the, uh, you know, at the, the script stage and they said, well, since she was a real person at the time of the film, she was alive, 
they were concerned, so they, they wisely, and it was probably a smart move, they changed it to Jenny. Still the same character, just changed it a little bit. We go to Swamp Thing, DC's second attempt at, at a feature film, uh, directed by Wes Craven. Um, unfortunately, the thing that really hampers this film, the story's not that bad. The budget was exceptionally small. Not only did he get a small budget initially, they actually cut his small budget right as they were filming. So it was like, let's say they gave him three million dollars, then they said, no, you're going to do it for a million and a half. So that's unfortunately one of the things that did hamper that adaption of the film. But it was still swamping. Now we have Scott Pilgrim. Um, kind of an interesting thing because uh, it, it, this is one of those films where you have a director that really was like almost born to do the source material. Edgar Wright was literally born to do Scott Pilgrim. And I, you know, there's really not much more to say than Scott Pilgrim is probably one of one of the greatest com you know, comic films of all time. Now we have Hellboy. Uh, Hellboy is interesting because in, in a lot of respects there are two Hellboys. There's Mike Bingolia's Hellboy and then there's Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy. And never the two shall meet. Um, the ultimate thing, I know a lot of people were very upset about the new Hellboy announcement that Ron Perlman wasn't going to be in it. But here's the thing. Guillermo del Toro had an idea for the third film. He wanted $150 million to make Hellboy 3. At a certain point, when the first one made maybe, it made about $60 million, the second one did about 70 Sadly, nobody's going to hand Guillermo del Toro $150 million to do a movie that, unfortunately, was not a success. But the studio stupidly released it two days before The Dark Knight. That wouldn't have made any difference. Yeah. No, it would. Now, I can tell you why. Because, because one, one, of, one of the things was, that one of the comments made by a studio head when they were pitching the first film was, does, does it actually have to have hell in the title? The same person also said, does he have to be red? And what we have eventually figured out that that head of the studio was Universal who ended up picking up Hellboy too. So apparently it wasn't too bad the second time around. But ultimately the, the thing with Hellboy is, I agree that didn't help its case, but ultimately Hellboy is kind of it's more of a specialized thing, you know, and, and unfortunately that is what is one of the biggest problems with Hollywood right now is they know how to make small films. They know how to make comedies. They know how to make rom-coms. Then that middle period, you know, something that's say 60 to 80 million, they don't make those movies anymore. Those movies are gone from the studio system. They know how to make 100, at this point, 150 plus films. Um, as a matter of fact, Warner was, the budget for Wonder Woman was only $150 million, and for a studio that is bargain based. And they, they, the only reason that they were able to get, you know, that much money is because, they, because in the case of Patty Jenkins, she had everything planned out. She planned every single thing out, because she knew that they were not going to give her any money or go over budget. And the other thing, especially going back to Wonder Woman for just a second, was Patty Jenkins said something very interesting at WonderCon. Now, we've all seen the scene when they go into the alley, right? Does that scene look familiar? Superman. Exactly. The reason being, when she was seven years old, she saw Superman. And at, she that, here. And, and at that point, she, she, had, she understood and she has that same mon mantra of verisimilitude, be true to anything. Because ultimately, what what's the one thing that costs you nothing as a filmmaker? Costs you absolutely zero dollars. No. Your script. There is no excuse for a bad script. Because I understand it takes time to write a script, but the point is, it ultimately doesn't cost you any money. So if you do not write a good script, then you've wasted your time and everyone else's time. The, the, a movie, especially a movie or even a comic book, lives and dies by its script. Everything else, if you've got a great script, everything else falls into place. Why is Watchmen so good as a comic book? Not necessarily a film, I do like Watchmen. <laughs> but the point is, Alan Moore had a great script. 
which was also originally based on comic characters. It was based on the Charlton characters. But DC did they wanted to do stuff with those characters. They did not want Alan to like do what he did with Watchmen to those characters because then they couldn't use them that way anymore. So the thing is, so he created he basically they are still those characters that that you know Rorschach is the question. You know, uh, Owlman is the blue beetle. He just changed the name. But the point was, so he had that script. Then you have Dave Gibbons who came in and made that script come to life. So that's that's what I'm saying. That's how it all works. You make a film, you have a great script. Then you bring in you, you know, your the thing that will make your film more than anything else beyond your script is your cast. You cast your film well or your short, then you've done the majority of your job. Just like anything else. It's all it's it's how you put the project together. Whether it's comics, film, whatever. It's how everything comes together. So we'll just kind of keep going through here. Losers, interesting one. Now this is an interesting one because the poster on, these are both posters done by Warner Brothers. Poster on the left is actually done by the original artist. He, they actually commissioned him to do a poster for this. It's done by Jock. Um, the interesting thing about the losers, and sadly, if you, if you have not seen the losers, you should because Here's the interesting thing. They, Andy Daigle and Jock basically said, we love 80s action movies. We love Lethal Weapon and stuff like that. I mean, who does it? So what do you do? You make a comic that's basically all those 80s films rolled up into one. The problem is, unfortunately, when The Losers came out, apparently nobody wanted to see 80s action films again. But it is, and it also marks Chris Evans, who seemed to be, he's trying his darkest to be in every single company's comic book movie ever. He's done a good job. He's been at DC. He's been at Marvel. You know, he's he's been at Fox with with Fantastic Four. So, um, and it's also one of those movies that's got an incredible cast. Now, here's another interesting one: Big Hero Six. And as you can see with the comic cover, does that look anything like that film? No, because in this case, what it was is they basically just took the essence of what the book was, and pretty much just took, took uh, Hero and then the robot, and that's what they that's what they built the story around. When was that? When was that? The uh, it was in the 90s. And Chris Claremont. I was say, Claremont, Claremont, yeah, he, he wrote it. It was, never, it was never a big success. Yeah. Um, he wrote the second series. It was um, it was the group who did Ben 10. It was uh, Steven Seagal. He actually wrote the original one, and then this, this was the follow-up. Um, but yeah, it, once again, it was it was a comic. Now here's another interesting one. Uh, you know, ba loosely based on the the, the graphic novel. The gra graphic novel came out a number of years ago. The interesting thing, and that's what Hollywood is doing right now. They buy everything. If it's a comic, they buy. It. You know, as a matter of fact, like The Walking Dead had been bought a long time before it got made. There's a lot of stuff that just takes years and years to get made for whatever reason, especially smaller uh, books like this. Um, you have one of the first, uh, the explosion of the 80s black and white era. Uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a complete and total ripoff of Frank Miller's run. It wasn't kind of, it totally was. Uh, and then of course it was years later, it uh, became a cottage industry for uh, New World Pictures. Another one of that rough period was The Mask. Uh, Dark Horse uh, was a small, very small company at the time. Uh, and The Mask was actually one of their kind of second wave of books uh, were black and white during the boom of the 80s. Uh, but The Mask was, uh, they were lucky enough, and actually Dark Horse co-produced that film with Universal, which they still have a deal with. Uh, another one of their, uh, it was produced by Dark Horse, was Dr. Gable. Now, Dread, really, no Stallone? We don't talk about that. <laughs> we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that because that is not Judge Dredd. I like Stallone. That is, because, one, because the ultimate key, and, and once again, it's interesting to bring up, why Dredd works so well is because he never took the helmet off. But there's a real good reason if you, re and once again, you go back to the source material, There's a real, you understand exactly why they said that helmet is not coming off. And it was not, it, partially, I'm sure the Sloan thing did not help their situation. But 
Uh, that's if you love Dread, you should definitely just go back and read the original uh, comics. Uh, obviously, the most well known is the the uh, Brian Mullen period. Now we come to Blade, which we talked about earlier. Now, explain to me how these two are like the same. <laughs> One's good. No, well, you see, you once again, you there's there's a misnomer. It's the the look is one thing, because you have to remember, when did the Tomb of Dracula come out? That was in the 70s. So look at it. He's the 70s. But, but, the, but, but the thing is, it was, it's, it's the character that Marv Wolfman created that was great. You know, it, it's, see, here's the thing. You have to remember, and this is important, don't look at things in today's eyes. You have to look at things differently. You have to, that is a different period. You have to under, you know, you may have not grown up in that period, but it's a different time. Just like, you know, a good example is is Batman. Many people have done Batman through the years. During the sixties, during the Batman craze, Carmen Infantino was the pretty much the artist on Batman. He designed Batgirl and everything. Then Neil Adams came along. Now do we all know who Neil Adams is? Okay. Neil Adams came along and drew Batman. They got more letters complaining about his art because it wasn't it wasn't of its time. He was ahead of his time, and that's why you know once again you have to like you know you, you kind of look at this blade and you go those aren't no they are it's of its time and once again the Wesley Snipes film is of its time. So that's you know that's where you kind of see the comics you know looking past. Now we go into the television side, where in some respects, a lot of people talk about films, you know, Wonder Woman, we, you know. Television is now replaced films of the story. Let's be realistic. Studios care about making money. They do not care. And part of the, part of the reason that, you know, who, who, who here went and seen the newest Transformer film? Who, okay. Sorry. Most Sorry. people, Sorry. But, most, but most people don't care. But the point is, why did the studio make that film? Because it made money. Toys. It made money, and that's what the public seems to want. It gives the so if you want to change what is in the cinema, you pay with your dollars. And that is why now television, you know, like like a good example is Preacher. Preacher was optioned as a film multiple times. Preacher would not make, it would make a terrible film. Why? Because it's too big. That's the advantage of television. You have a wide swath. Why does Game of Thrones work so well? Because you're not telling it in two and a half hours. Tops, you'd probably get. You know. So, we also owe a lot of debt to Batman because people, you know, I'm not even old enough to remember the Batman. I'm like with you, I'm in the post, you know, I remember reruns in syndication before there was television. The point is, Batman was huge, and you can see with Mike Allred's cover for the last issue, he, those, are, there was so much merchandise. There was so much, it was insane. As a matter of fact, they shot the first season. The, during, after the first season was over, they made the film. They just kept shooting. As a matter of fact, they didn't even take a break going to the second season. They shot that entire show concurrently because it was that big. And ABC at one point was showing it two nights a week. It was huge. Well, you yeah, had to. They, you couldn't wait for the quick hangers. That's right. <laughs> but the other thing was, remember all the people that came out the window, like Sammy Davis Jr.? They had a line of people, not initially, because if you look at the first few episodes, there weren't as many stars. Once it hit, because everybody, everybody, wanted, to be everybody wanted to be. I mean, they had people lining up. You know, I mean, Sammy Davis Jr. in Batman, I mean, Really? Come on! That's awesome! But that's the case now with movies, though, because like, now everybody wants to be on Superman. Well, that kind of, that also came from the animation where, you know, unfortunately, where part of the problem lies with that is you hire, you, do, you should hire a voice or an actor, not who they are. Right. Because as we say, you know, once again, Brad Pitt, he sells dollars. Did he sell Sinbad? No, no, and he was, and no. he was supposed to be Captain America originally, and they, right. but we can't because you just see Brad Pitt, you wouldn't see Captain. Well, but also, you know, also have to remember that the big thing with Captain America is is, uh, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Is yeah. is we're going to the directors, but let, let me just go. We got a few more. Wonder Woman, once again, very brave 
for its time in 77 because, you know, woman, comic book, you know, who knew it? Once again, we go back to Preacher. A very faithful adaption, but also its own thing, which is what you should do when you do adaption. As the, as they, as the producers say, we have a roadmap. Let's go with that roadmap. But we need to be our own thing. And then we have some interesting ones. We have Constantine, which was actually in Alan Moore's run of Swamp Thing. That's where he originated. And it's an interesting one because then he got his own comic, Hellblazer. Then there's the Tanya Reeves movie. Love it or hate it. It was successful. But then when the TV show came around, they actually went more back to the roots of the comic. Uh, and Matt was actually you know, quite good. And it's a real shame that it ended up on NBC because it was just, it was the wrong network for the wrong show. And that happens a lot. Uh, that happens a number of times. We also have another one that's very interesting is The Tick uh, has had three iterations. Uh, there was obviously the comic that started. The animated series came second. The interesting one about the second one is, if you remember the animated series, Remember a lot of the characters were named one thing in the animated series and one thing in the show? Well, there was a weird contractual thing that because of the animated series, they could, they could use the characters, but they couldn't call them that, the, the names from that. Right, so there was something going on. So anyways, uh, from the initial reports on the Amazon series, all that's there. What villains are going to use, we don't quite know yet. But they do. So that does start actually very soon, and I hopefully, think, fingers. Uh, Patrick Warburton's suit's better than that. Um, I see. I no. As, as, a, as a comic person, I disagree because if you look at the two pictures, look. I understand Patrick Warburton was great. The problem is, who? What do you see? You do not see the tick. You see oh, Patrick yeah, I think Warburton. They I, I, with the suit, the, the exception should have been they should have gave him the eyes. They did actually. Uh, it was Barry Sonnenfeld that nixed that idea. They did do some. They did do some ass tests. Uh, he didn't like it because he felt that it was restricting Patrick's facial expressions, which it kind of did. But then in the long run, it was just like the Patrick Warburton show, which is not a bad thing. But it was more that than the tech. Um, and then finally, I'll go through some of. I mean, there's tons of comics out there. First and foremost, if you live around here, right down on Clark Avenue is Pulp Fiction. They have everything. They sell graphic novels at 40% off. Look, I do not work for those people. I just shop there. But some of these are, are some of my current favorites. Saga, you know. Everyone you, needs to read Saga. It's, it's, one, of those, it's one of those books. Uh, the Flintstones, okay, the Flintstones and Perez have an interesting thing. Mark Russell, the writer of that, uh, writes for television, uh, but the interesting thing about the Flintstones is we've all seen the Flintstones. We all know the Flintstones, right? What he did is he didn't, and this is what makes a good writer, he didn't try to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to change the Flintstones, do you? We love the Flintstones. What he did was, we all, there's that story behind that rock. Like there's all this other stuff, but we never really get to see it because it's a sitcom. What he did is he told that story behind it. A good example is, Pebble and Bam Bams is older, they're like teenagers, smart move. Babies can't really do much. It, it, look, they honestly didn't do much in the series. They were cute, but yeah. So when they go to school, who is their professor? Carl Sagan. Now, you don't have to know who Carl Sagan is, but if you know who Carl Sagan is, then you're like, damn, that's fun. Because Carl Sagan created Cosmos. And if you've seen the Neil deGrasse Tyson version, that is what it's based on the 70s show by him. But he, a good, another good example is, so in the first issue, Fred wants to make some more money. So he goes, tries to sell vitamins door to door. How's that going to turn out? Come on, door in the face. So Barney gets in on the thing. He hears commotion over there. He says, so you see Bam Bam holding up a card. He says, if you eat these vitamins, you're going to get really strong. People are throwing money out. That's, see, that's the thing. That is not, he's not changing what the Flintstones was, but he's telling you those stories kind of behind the scenes. Uh, the new Lord Jerome Archie has been reimagined. Obviously, we have Riverdale based on the Archie uh, series. Uh, and this, uh, the new series, uh, and if you like Saga, Fiona Staple did the first six issues of that. 
Uh, Black Hammer, uh, written by Jeff Lemire, who's like one of my current favorite writers right now. Um, Perez, basically this uh, YouTube sensation of Corn Dog Girl, who basically burnt her hair in the corn dog machine, became president. So it's very interesting and also very timely. We have the Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, which is one of my favorite Marvel books, and she's actually going to be on uh, in one of the new Marvel series. Doom Patrol, which has had many iterations, the, la the, the, the biggest one being in the 90s. This one's written by Gerard Way, who is obviously more known for his music, but has become a good, a good uh, little writer. And Vision, written by Tom King, who is really almost one of the best up-and-coming uh, comic writers. Um, basically, we know the Vision, but what if the Vision and his family tried to live in a normal neighborhood? <laughs> how, do you think, how do you think that's going to work out? And it, it's it's interesting because at one point, the wife kills the kills somebody who comes to the house and covers it up. The the daughter freaks out at school. So think about it. these are all androids, and it's 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 interesting because it's it takes that you know what if story to almost a whole nother level. So I mean, there's tons and tons of books up there. Uh, you can also go if you don't if you don't live down here. There's tons of comic shops in LA. You can always look. Um, so that's pretty much it as far as that goes. Um, but I just really want to point out that there is look. I love superheroes just as much as everybody. I always say this. Can you eat Twinkies all the time? <laughs> no, I never would. I mean they're great and it's like candy. You can eat it, but it's just like with Marvel and DC. I love, I, you know, I have a more fondness for DC than Marvel. I do not hate Marvel. Uh, but the point is, there is so much, much more out there. And the, especially, you know, I remember, you know, Kevin Smith always said, you know what a comic book is? He said it's doing a movie with a completely unlimited budget, which is exactly what it is. Because you can tell anything you want to. Because an artist can draw nearly anything you could think of. But, you know, there are a lot of good superhero books, but there's a lot of other things. But it kind of goes back to the Wonder Woman. Go out, check things out. I mean, I write reviews every single week. There's a ton of books, and I know it's scary. There's a million books out there. And there's a lot of good stuff. Like she said, Saga. I mean, and, and a company like Image, they put the first trade out. It's $10 for the first, like, six issues. It's a deal. You know. So you can, you know, there's, and, and for a lot of people, a lot of people don't read comics. Trades are a great way. I mean, you can read, you can catch up on The Walking Dead. You can catch up on all this stuff. You know, you can read Watchmen. Hopefully you've read that. If you haven't read Watchmen, you do, should read Watchmen. Plus, then that leads you to other things like Alan Moore's League of, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Now, in the case of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it's interesting because the main villain, the first story arc is Fu Manchu. Now, how do you think that's going to play in the cinema? Yeah, that ain't going to play at all. So that's why they had to change that. But the book is incredible. There's a lot of great stuff out there. And, you know, even superhero stuff, there's, you know, tons of stuff. Just look, look and see what's out there and read, read, read. Because think about it, Hollywood's reading. I think you should too. Everybody should be reading comics. <laughs> well, you forgot V for Vendetta. That's true. Uh, <laughs> once again, once again, when you read Alan Moore, you know of these things. <laughs>